Hello, calculus kids. This is Mr. Bean. Today's lesson, we're going to learn a little bit about continuity and discontinuities. Hopefully, for many of you, this is a review, but if it's not, don't worry. We're going to start off pretty basic here uh, and go through this as if you'd never even heard of continuity. So I'm going to explain this first part as that you could explain it to your little brother or sister or even Mr. Brust. He could understand it this way. And that is, you just take a function. If you can draw the function and never have to lift your pen or pencil, it's considered continuous. Whereas over here, if I start drawing this one, I can draw down this branch, but then I have to lift my pencil up in the air and put it back down and continue graphing. So the second I have to lift up my pen, that is when it's no longer continuous and it has a discontinuity right here. All right, so here are the types of discontinuities that we're going to focus on. The first one we'll talk about is what's just called a hole. A hole, and this, this graph matches that, a hole is considered removable. Why is it removable? Because if I filled in the hole, that would then make this graph continuous. So I could remove the discontinuity just by seeing, just by simply filling in that little hole right there. Okay, so first type is just a hole. Next off, we have a discontinuity due to a vertical asymptote. So if we have a vertical asymptote, right, this example here, it's considered non-removable. You can't remove it because you, there's no little dot that you can just fill in with one point and make it continuous. All right, and then in our last example, we'll talk about our jump discontinuities. Usually you have some type of piecewise function that uh, breaks the graph apart right here, and that's also considered non-removable. Again, because if I fill in the hole, that doesn't just make this thing continuous. Now in our lesson today, in our packet and on the examples I'm going to give you in your practice problems, really we're just going to focus in on just these two. In our next lesson, we'll focus in on jump discontinuity, as well as giving a nice definition of continuity, how you, a mathy way of doing it, the one that Mr. Bruss struggles with. So how do we know if the function has a discontinuity? Well, usually you're going to have these fractions here, and the it's going to have a discontinuity if the denominator equals zero. Why? Because denominators can't equal zero. We cannot divide by zero. You'd have major problems there. So there's not going to be a graph of anything if the denominator ever equals zero. So what we want to focus on is that. Um, let's go ahead and factor this whole thing. So I'm going to take my numerator and denominator, factor them both. So on top I'll get x minus 2, and on bottom I'll get it, or excuse me, and on top also an x minus 6. So x minus 2 times x minus 6, that'll give us the positive 12 and add to the negative 8. And then on bottom, let's do an x uh, minus 2 again and an x plus 5. So if you were to multiply all this out, you'd get x squared plus 3x minus 10 on bottom. Okay, so again, we're trying to figure out when does the denominator equal 0. So I can see right here, if I solve that, I'm going to get x equals 2. So there's definitely a discontinuity at x equals 2. And here at x equals negative 5, if you solve both of those. There's my discontinuities. Now what type are they? Is it one of the three things that we talked about from before? Is it a hole? Is it a discontinuity, a jump discontinuity? Well, I'm telling you right now, none of these are going to be jump discontinuities, okay? Because we're, we're ignoring that for this lesson. We're going to jump into those, ha, <laughs> jump into those in the next lesson. Uh, so if the factor crosses out and cancels, it represents a hole in that case. So we have a hole at x equals 2. And if it does not cancel, if it just stays there and does not cancel out, then that is a vertical asymptote. And I'll just abbreviate it like that. Okay, so there's your answers for this one. But as a reminder, this x equals 2 as a whole, that is a removable discontinuity, right? Because if you fill in the hole, it's now gone. The discontinuity is gone. Whereas this one is a non-removable. And I'm going to be fine if you just call this a hole in our practice. And if you call this one a vertical asymptote, you don't have to say that it's a removable hole. You can just call it a hole. I just want to make sure that the terminology for removable and non-removable is ingrained in your mind for this. All right, number two, let's go on here. So again, we're trying to figure out when does this denominator equal zero? The numerator is already factored. So uh, let's go ahead and factor out. So x plus one all over. This is, if you can recognize it, is the difference of squares. That will become x squared minus 1 and x squared plus 1. All right, now we are going to factor again because this, this one is also the difference of squares. So let's, uh, in fact, I'll just do it right over here. So I have x plus 1 all over this long fraction here. That's going to factor to 
x minus 1, x plus 1, and then this does not factor. x squared plus 1 does not factor. There's no such thing as the sum of squares for you to be able to factor that. Okay, so now what, uh, what's going to cancel? My x plus 1 is going to cancel. So let's uh, write that we have a whole at what value? That's the one that canceled, so it's at x equals negative 1. That's my whole. What doesn't cancel? Well, the x minus 1 doesn't cancel, so I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, positive 1. Okay, so that takes care of that one. And that takes care of that one. What about this one? Well, there's not going to be an answer here because I'll show you down here why. If you take x squared plus 1 and set it equal to 0 and solve, you get x squared equals negative 1, and then you solve that, you get x equals plus or minus an imaginary number. The square root of negative 1 is imaginary, and we are not dealing with imaginary numbers on this, so thank goodness. So all we have to worry about on this graph is that we have a whole at x equals negative 1, and you have, whoops, there we go, whole at negative 1 and a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. On the next problem, we've got a trig function. So when you have trig functions, you have to think, okay, well, what is the denominator of this thing? Uh, that doesn't look like it has a denominator, but if I rewrite it, sine of 2x all over cosine of 2x, if I rewrite tangent as sine over cosine, then you can see it does now have a denominator. So when does cosine of 2x equal 0? Well, I'm going to do something here. So don't write this part down. I'm going to completely draw something else here. I'm going to draw myself a quick little circle. You'll see why in just a minute. And I want to, instead of cosine of 2x, I'm just going to say cosine of x. Again, don't write this part down. Just watch what I'm doing. So when does cosine of x equal 0? That happens at the top of the unit circle and at the bottom of the unit circle. And some of you may use uh, special right triangles. Uh, I like using the unit circle to help me remember. So cosine is equal to 0 at the very top and the very bottom. So when what angle is that? That happens when x would equal, so when the, the angle equals pi over 2, it happens when x equals uh, 3 pi over 2. Okay, and then we could keep going. So it, in, it goes around in a circle forever and ever and ever and ever. So if I kept going, it would be x equals the top, we're at the top again, that's 5 pi over 2. I could keep going and say x equals 7 pi over 2. And I could keep going and say x equals 9 pi over 2. And you go on forever and ever and ever and ever. All right, so blah, 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 blah. That's why we have this restriction right here that we're only going to look from 0 to 2 pi. So when the x values are between 0 and 2 pi. So let's give this a shot here. So now we go back to this cosine of 2x. So write this part down. Uh, when does cosine of 2x equal 0? It happens when 2x equals, so here it was just an x, and so we just wrote when x equals, but here it's a 2x, so we're going to write when 2x equals pi over 2. Or when 2x equals, what was the other one? 3 pi, oops, 3 pi over 2. Or when 2x equals, uh, what's this one, 5 pi over 2. There we go, 5 pi over 2. Uh, I could keep going, 7 pi over 2. But, in fact, let's stop right there at 5 pi over 2. 5 divided by 2, right now, 5 divided by 2, that's bigger than the 2 pi, right? So some of you might be thinking, why do you need to check this one? Because if we were just going to 2 pi, we've already gotten to 2 pi. But we haven't solved for x yet. Watch what I mean. If I take this thing and divide both sides by 2, I get x equals pi over 4. Okay, there's my first answer. Boom. There's one discontinuity. I solve for this one. I get divide both sides by 2, or multiply by 1 half, if that makes it easier. 3 pi over 4. So there's another discontinuity. Now, if I solve this one, divide both sides by 2, or multiply by 1 half, I get 5 pi over 4. So while it's true, the setup I had with 5 pi over 2, while that is outside this range, when you actually solve for x, that's not. The x value is still within our given range, and so we can, we can keep going. So you have to keep checking. So let's go to another one. 2x equals, what's the 7 pi over 2? 7 pi over 2. If I divide both sides by 2, I get 7 pi over 4, and that's still within the, the, the possibility. Now that's the last one, so you don't have to write the next one. I'll show you why. You might maybe write it if you 
want to be able to keep track of this because nine, whoops, two X equals nine pi over two. And when you solve that, you get X equals nine pi over four. And that nine over four is bigger than two pi. So you don't have to worry about that one. Okay, so all of these are vertical asymptotes because they don't cancel out with anything that's on top. All right, now let's do the last one, which is actually the nicest, easiest one on here. Let me get rid of all this stuff. Sometimes they'll give you a function where you're supposed to find the discontinuities and there actually aren't any discontinuities. See this graph, this x squared, that's just a parabola. It's a parabola that opens up, shifted down one. That's all this is. X squared minus one is a parabola opening up. So there are no discontinuities anywhere in this thing. So what we'll say for our answer on this is we're just gonna say that it's a continuous function. And by saying it's continuous function, what we really mean is that there are no discontinuities. There we go. Okay, so no discontinuities on this thing. There's no denominators you gotta stress about or worry about on that. So we're not gonna have any discontinuities. So just recognize those types of problems. If it's asking for the discontinuities and it's a continuous function, that's all, you can just say that. Continuous function. Or you could say no to discontinuities too, I guess, if you want. All right, that's everything for this lesson. So rock that mastery check and I'll see you back in the next one.